Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. <laughs> Hey dads and moms, welcome to Modern Dadhood. Uh, This is an ongoing conversation about the joys, challenges, and general insanity of being a dad in this moment. And this particular moment, for the record, is a pretty damn weird one. My name is Adam Flaherty, I'm a father of two daughters, six and three, and I'm all alone today. No Mark here across from me. If you're listening to this episode when it's new, we're about a week into what folks are calling social distancing due to the coronavirus. And if coronavirus is old news to you, then you've seen into the future and hopefully we all come out safe on the other end of this thing that was totally unexpected and none of us were really prepared for. So we have this shared Google Doc for the podcast where we're always putting down ideas for fatherhood related topics, guests we'd like to invite, really any ideas for content or subject matter to consider for the show. And very early on, one of the topics that I wanted to cover was the instinct that we have as fathers to protect our kids. Now, I was originally thinking about that in terms of protecting them from bullies harmful things on the internet or physical pain, but this worldwide pandemic has adjusted my perspective a bit in regards to protecting my kids, and it feels timely to have a conversation with my friend Kevin Sturdivant about how his family is carrying on through the weird, weird current state of things and about how since long before the coronavirus was even in our vocabulary, Kevin's had to be extremely diligent about protecting his son, Sam, from viruses. So Kevin Sturdivant and his wife, Mo, have been personal friends of mine since elementary school, really, right? Yeah. (laughs) Feels like a a hundred years ago. I remember distinctly third grade. How have you guys been? Uh, We've been managing, man. We're we're good. We're uh, we're making the most of things right now, and it's a little bit different, but we're good now. Yeah, it's a really crazy and surreal thing to be living through. Surreal is the word. (laughs) So you and I had our first kids around the same time. Uh, Sam was born just a few months before my daughter. We haven't gotten our families together in a while, but I I do love seeing pictures of Sam pop up on social media now and then. And it seems like he's really thriving. But in the beginning, you guys went through some really hard and really traumatic stuff uh, as parents. Can you give our listeners sort of a condensed version of what happened when Sam was born and, and how it affected your lives? Yeah, absolutely. So he was born with basically a virus. Um, it was called enterovirus and, um, a couple of the kids in the, at that time had it, but, uh, it was, it was pretty damaging to a young, to a young, you know, neonate. He was, he was probably born with it. And then very quickly thereafter kind of went downhill, um, pretty far downhill, pretty, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, we were, we were told, um, we have reached the limits of extraordinary care and then went to bed. It was an incredible journey and it was, uh, it involved, uh, an organ transplant. His liver had failed and, uh, he needed a new liver and that was clear. And so we went down to Boston children's. They, uh, were fantastic. Um, he was listed and, um, he received a transplant and that was at 30 days old. Uh, He was among the smallest that they've ever transplanted and uh, we're extraordinarily lucky to have found that hospital at that time, had the medical care that we had to get us there. Um, It was a, it was a real threading of the needle that he is still here. And now he's six and he is strong, full weight. You know, he's in shape. He loves riding his bike. He's doing great. Um, how's he been liking kindergarten before all of this shit hit the fan? Yeah. So Sam's adjustment to kindergarten was pretty good. You know, I think it was, um, pretty smooth. I don't, you know, we were ready for some bumps, like socially, we didn't know what was going to happen with, I hesitate to call it academics. Uh, but you know, uh, how it was, how it was going to work out, uh, what sort of impediments he was going to encounter. And he's on immune suppression medication. Uh, it's sort of something that, 
you know, he takes every day, twice a day, and he's more at risk than most kids. That said, he's in the same classes, doing the same stuff. You know, they encourage us not to let him play football, but that was a pretty <laughs> easy sell. I think they're uh, encouraging everybody to not play football anymore, right? With all the concussions yeah, and stuff. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're very lucky and that was, it was a struggle, but, um, we're here now. Yeah. I keep saying that, but it's, that's, that's the feeling. So because of his condition, you've always had to keep him a little bit shielded from things. Like you didn't put him into, um, like a big daycare facility and and things like that when he was young. Right. Yeah. We're always the people who are asking what your rates of vaccination are, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, at a daycare level. Um, I stayed home for two years with him. So that's, as a dad, that was a pretty formative experience, you know, boom, we had a kid and then it was like, okay, well, we're both home for a while. Eventually someone has to go back to work. Uh, I was the good pick to stay home and it was a, it was an experience, but you know, it was sort of a privilege too. So how was work going for you now? So you were teaching, you were doing carpentry and now you're starting a cider facility. Yeah. Uh, ta-da. <laughs> work has been a variable product for me. Uh, I, I wanted to teach freshman English for a long time and I did that for 10 years and then became a you know, push back into carpentry and maxed out there for myself, not, not in skills, but in just interest yeah. and, uh, and moved on to trying this new venture. So it's been an accommodating path. I think even as a teacher, I have done a lot of teaching online and uh, staying home. My, my career path has been an accommodating path for a parent, I would say. Are you getting to spend as much time with both of your kids as you'd like to? 100%. <laughs> At least for the last few days. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and besides the last few days, yes. I think so. You know, it's, it's having a young kid is, uh, we like to take running starts at it. I think my wife and I do. So, you know, you get into it and we find ourselves getting a little frustrated, not being the parent we want to be, needing to tap out. And so that's what I mean by rank start. The next person comes running in, like excited to do the job in a, in a productive way that we know is best for our kids. And sometimes, um, you know, one of us doesn't have the energy. So the other one steps in. And I think I have enough contact where I sometimes tap out. It's definitely important to, to still have your own identity outside of being a parent. And I'm sure that, you know, the stay at home thing for the first couple of years really sort of drove that notion home. It was, it was really difficult, actually. Uh, I, I had, I had a tricky time with it. It was not as easy as I had hoped. You know, it's, I was kind of hoping it would take some of the, some of my focus off of me as an individual. Uh It kind of (laughs) did, but it just really complicated it, you know? So it wasn't quite the relief I was expecting in one specific way. Uh, but it gave me something else to care a lot about. And, uh, and so that's been a better upshot than I could have imagined. So back to what's going on right now in the world, we're all doing this social distancing thing. We're isolating to whatever degree we can, or we feel comfortable, but from all of the data that's being shared, the most vulnerable people in our population are older people and people who have compromised immune systems like Sam. So with him being immunocompromised, I imagine that must be extremely stressful for you guys. Does that, does it bring you back to when things were so, you know, touch and go early on? Yes, uh, it does. It's something that we've sort of periodically revisited though, you know, um, uh, the fear it comes, it ebbs and flows. And that's, you know, the, the shoe, you know, the other foot drop, the other shoe dropping is something that my wife and I always talk about. It's always over our head. When someone asks, how you doing? We're like, great. But what we really mean is I'm super nervous about my kid. And, uh, and that's a, it's something that we've gotten used to where it's, it's a functional thing that we just know about it. And we have each other to, to base ourselves on in that way. Uh, we balance each other out where one person gets super upset or, you know, concerned. And that's a great opportunity for me or for my wife to come up and say, you know what? It's really not quite like that. We're okay. And and that's a trusted voice. And so that's, it would be difficult to do alone because it is such a head game that um, I feel like a lot of people are, are noticing this now 
probably for the first time. But really what you're feeling is how immune suppressed people feel all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's more severe now. I'm not, I don't want to make that analogy quite, quite as tight, but there's some of it in there. And so for us now, yeah, it's concerning. It was concerning for us enough that we pulled Sam out of school early. We bought a bunch of food and went to the country early. Um, You know, my wife stopped working in the office early and, and still, even without a, some idea of how he, it could get into our house, there's a nervousness for sure. There's just this feeling of help, helplessness, you know, it's, it's like this invisible, I don't know, this invisible force that you just feel is like coming towards you. It's like, how the hell do you protect them from something that you can't, you can't even see? Well, they can see it in your face. That's true. This is something that Mo and I have noticed uh, we really are careful about our expression. And especially in this moment where the kids know what's up, they heard it, they know it's called coronavirus and they don't know what it means. Um, how are your girls coping with it? My older daughter is six, but same age as Sam. And we're, we're talking to her about it. I mean, we talked to both of them about it, but, but I think just like you said, we're trying to model, you know, um, calmness and rationality around it. I don't know. I think it's okay to express fear. Um, I don't have a problem with our girls seeing us be a little bit vulnerable and feel nervous about something, but I think it's our job as parents to also assure them that we're all going to get through this together. Yep. And it's a, it's an absence that we're kind of used to in a way, you know, um, anyone who's had a conversation about death with their kid is sort of familiar with what you talk about and maybe what you don't. Um, as far as stress coming in from outside, you know, we see ourselves as a regulator, as if on a, you know, an oxygen tank or <laughs> bad, anal- bad analogy. But, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure outside and we're going to let some through, but a, a, an, an amount that we are right, that we are noticing and taking track, you know, keeping track of. How are you managing your stress and sort of keeping your mental health in check as, as a dad during this time. Yeah, that's really, you know, it's, you know, it's challenging. I'm not going to, it's now is an unprecedented time. Um, you know, we have family members who are in the medical profession who will tell you to, um, put your oxygen mask on first as a parent, um, in order to better serve your children. And so what do you need to do to be the best parent to your kids? Do you need to go do a hundred pushups? Do you need to go for a run? Do you need to make sure that you run every day or whatever it is? For me, I found much to my amazement that running works. Yeah. (laughs) Never thought that I would be a runner, but it's something that um, allows me to think. It allows me to get over the emotional reaction to things and get down to a couple different ways of thinking about it. Time to myself is important. I'm an only child and uh, I feel that still, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. I still feel, especially these days where we're all inside and we're, you know, edu parenting and all that. It's important, I think, to get out, get some space to yourself, burn that energy off. You know, I've often said that you got to walk the dog, you know, (laughs) like you got to, you got to take yourself out for a walk Mm -hmm. once in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and prepare to be the best parent you can for your kid who doesn't have a choice on how you behave. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. They're just witnessing how you guys are handling it and processing it and, um, and continuing to live your life. So, yeah. So one of the other things that came out of Sam's liver transplant was a, a pretty ripping case of PTSD for me. What, so what triggers me is seeing other kids in distress. Like if I see, a kid being pushed down the street at 1130 in town Portland in a, in a, you know, a stroller. My immediate thought is what the hell is happening? Why is that kid outside right now? It's 1130 at night. There's a whole bunch wrong right now for that kid. And I just spiral spiral. How Uh, I just keep thinking about that kid and I keep imagining things that I don't know. So this PTSD has is given you this sort of inherent instinct to protect other kids as well. Yeah. Like 
a wild, I'm going to jump out of the car and go interrogate that person. I think about it constantly. It's heavy stuff. When I think about protecting my girls in general, not from this um, specifically, but my instinct is is like anger. You're like if something comes between me and my girls, if something's threatening their well-being, I get pissed off about it and I like snap into Papa Bear mode. Are you dealing with any of that? You know, if I if I knew what to fight, if I knew what to be mad at, um, vaccines are an issue. Uh, our government is an issue. Unpleased. <laughs> Put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that doesn't really help me to be a dad. I'm definitely dealing with it. I don't know. Like, how do you balance those two things? I mean, I think it's natural. I think it's natural to get mad, right? I mean, I get I get very mad about the government right now. You know, and and God forbid anything happens to anybody that I care about through you know over the next however many weeks or months. Yeah, I think that, that I'll have a lot of anger and resentment towards the government. Yeah, yeah, it's just tough. Yeah. It's just tough to sort of feel feel helpless to, you know, to this and just know that we don't know how, don't know how long it's going to be, but we just got to ride it out, you know. Uh, aside from the obvious things that, you know, that we can do to sanitize, wash our hands, all that stuff, are there extra measures that you guys are doing in order to keep Sam healthy while No. Getting him outside, playing outside, showing him we love him. You know, using this as an opportunity rather than an uh, an obligation. I think everyone's trying to spin it that way. Cause what else can you do? We are very fortunate that we have a chance to go outside in a way that's like, you know, we're at my dad's house, put it that way. And we have, we live in town in a, in a, an apartment and we felt like we wanted to leave there because it's going to be hard to get outside. We, you know, we go down the stream and it, it's nice because it kind of like reminds me of what I did growing up mm-hmm. and it's, it's very, refreshing in that way. And honestly, I've had trouble being around our kids for long periods of time in the past where I was just eventually it boils up and I just like, ah, I gotta get, like, I, I need to like go outside and walk for something. You know, I just yep. not exactly wired perfectly to be a stay at home dad. I will say that, but these days it's a little different. I'm maybe it's the context. I give the context a lot of credit. I don't know. Does the, does the last few days feel different to you? Cause I feel like I'm really more enjoying and engaging. I'm trying to spin it that way. I'm also panicking, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, every day I have at least one instance where I try to reflect on the positive stuff that has come from it. So I'm getting to spend more, a lot more time with my kids, which in a normal work week, I'm seeing them for an hour before school and a couple of hours after school. Um, we're having good, meaningful time where I'm, you know, um, helping them do schoolwork and creative projects and we're getting outside a lot. You know, I'm getting more exercise. I was welcoming of like a big change in my routine. I, I'm not glad that this is what caused that, but I'm yeah. certainly going to try to find whatever positives I can in such like a weird, weird situation. Yep. Yep if we can just take all the, all the steps and precautions we can to keep the people who we care about and who are the most vulnerable safe and then take whatever positives we can out of the situation, that's probably the best we can do. Well, I think we can become better parents too. Um, like for example, I really sometimes struggle with, <laughs> with our daughter who is a, a lot like me hmm. and uh, is extraordinarily strong willed. Uh, she's four and she's basically been the same person her whole life. No surprise. Uh, she's probably going to be that way for a while, but, um, I have realized, uh, in the past, and this kind of leads up to this, but it's it certainly been punctuated in this experience. Um, at a certain point I realized that if I have a f- problem with a four-year-old, I have a problem. Yeah. But this is not her problem, you know? So it's not her fault. Uh, I'm not doing it right. So if we have a conflict, I need to change while I'm acting. Although yeah. four is old enough where she's picking up on cues and she knows what, but what buttons to press too. Right. Yeah. But that means I'm giving her buttons. Yeah. That's totally true. And you know, a house should be a button free environment. That's an environment of trust, right? 
when when the hell did you come across all of this uh, wisdom? Oh, it's bullshit. I think too much. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but you're totally spot on. It, that's absolutely true. Well, I think the truth is I've had a really hard time. That's the truth. You know, uh, I love my kids as much as you do. I promise. And it's been difficult to have a relationship, especially with my daughter. That's troublesome. That's, that's tricky. It's not just me, you know, and we, my wife has, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not isolated here, uh, but it wasn't working the way I wanted it to work. And it was really affecting my whole life. You know, I, I'd often said that if I can make this better, everything's better. Um, and so there's, there's been no, no small amount of effort going into it, I guess. How do you see the next few weeks or a few months going? I mean, nobody really knows, but what do you anticipate happens? I don't know. It's unknown. I'm trying to know what I know and know what I don't know and just sort of keep what I don't know in a closet. (laughs) So I don't know what it's going to look like. And it makes me pretty nervous. But I also know that as a family unit, we work. I'm not like the most optimistic person <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, I'm trying to be, you know, in this moment, both for myself, my wife and for my kids. Timelines are tricky. I would say not for months. We knew when we pulled them out of school, we were pretty much pulling them for the year because we have some sense of how infectious disease can work. I mean, it's just sort of a math problem. Right. And we'll see. It's also tough when, You know, you want to be able to get reliable information from the news. And now we're in this position where you almost have to question everything that you read. Yep, absolutely. But um, I think from a self-preservation standpoint, you really need to be careful about it. You need to stay simultaneously. And, you know, here's the rodeo is that you have to stay simultaneously informed and calm. But it'll pass. Yeah, eventually. Everything's a metaphor. And for me, and this one is like surfing, you know, we all just got rocked by a big wave. We're all just going to come up to the surface in the whitewater and go, what the hell happened? What's next? We're going to look up. Maybe, maybe we see another breaker. Maybe we don't. And everyone's after going to have to refine normal and it's not going to be what it was, but that's okay. Maybe it'll be better in some ways. I say that as looking at very much the top half of the glass. Well, I hope you're right. And uh, it's good to be optimistic in in times like this that are so uncertain. Kevin, best of luck to you and Mo getting through this. We'll be thinking of you guys. Uh, Love you guys. And uh, we're going to keep Sam in our thoughts and and this will pass. Thanks, buddy. Same to your family. Dads, I'd love to hear from you. How are you guys weathering the storm? Let me know. Reach out to us at hey, H-E-Y, at moderndadhood.com and let us know. Let us know how you're holding up. The truth is we really are all in this together. And a little bit of good news for you. As I was assembling this episode, I came across a recurring segment that Mark and I recorded a few weeks ago and didn't have a chance to use. So you get to hear Mark's beautiful voice after all. Lucky you. Here's a segment that we call, and I'm going to do my best Bill Curtis voice again. So that's a thing now. You have a so that's a thing now, right? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, And yours are always better than mine. Are they? They're funnier. Is it that? Is it that I'm just more of a raconteur than you? I believe so. I wouldn't even argue it. Um, what's the thing now at the check at home? Okay. So, uh, my kids are getting really good at saying no. And it's like, they say no about something and they don't even mean it, but they, they're getting good at saying it. And so they say it and then like, I don't know the meaning behind it. It doesn't even matter, you know, but like the feeling is there and the emotion is there. And then it just, they say it again and you're like, do you want to eat? No. Okay. Do you not want to eat? No. Mm -hmm. And then it just compounds and things get terrible and we spiral out. And sometimes there's these awful emotional explosions that happen. I've been there and it's so hard. It's so, it's so hard because there are times when it's like, okay, this emotional 
roller coaster is happening, but also like it's dinner time and you need to eat. And it's really hard to ha- make that happen when you're losing your mind, uh, when everybody's losing their mind. But there's been this thing that's been happening. One of my kids in particular has been having this like, this like problem where like nothing's just nothing's right. So everything's a no, nothing's a yes. Uh, he doesn't understand why. And, uh, by the time it's dinner time, it's, they're physically exhausted. They're mentally just beyond capacity. They're emotionally, they just like are off the charts. Um, they're excited to see mom and dad again, but they're tired and they're frustrated. They, they want to go to bed, but they don't want to go up the stairs and go to bed. They, <laughs> they want that, but they don't want the action that's involved. Right. So things just start to get like extremely irrational. Right. At this, at these moments. This is a, the, a very common theme in my house too. I'm sorry to hear it, but I'm also so happy to hear that. Oh, it's maddening. <laughs> and these are these moments where like, right up until this happens, uh, I'll admit that I, I start to get really frustrated and I don't know what to do. And I, I totally understand that what's happening in their minds when their brains are just not there yet, they're just not developed yet. So rationality, like, like, meeting them with some sort of rational, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. So you just have to humor them or distract them or get through it somehow. And sometimes they get just like really frustrated, especially I've walked in the door. It's, I've been home 20 minutes. I don't even have my coat off yet. But sometimes when this happens, I'm just like, this is where it's like, okay, <laughs> this is insane. Uh, but so what happens is, is this. Pick any food item. Banana. The boys like cheese. The boys do like cheese. Crackers, animal rice crackers. cake. They're into rice cakes. Okay. The big time. Well, I'll use a rice cake as an example. That's I can't, good. I can't give them like a whole rice cake because they're just going to bust it up and they're going to destroy it. And so oftentimes what we do is we, we give them a piece of something, you know, pieces. It, yeah. Yeah. Rice cakes can get soggy, whether they're in whole or part. Right. Yeah. So you break them or give them. Okay. Here's a piece of a rice cake. Enjoy this as a snack for dinner time. And he'll melt down because it's not whole. It's broken. And then he'll insist that he gets the other piece as well. And so you hand it over to him because you're like, okay, I'm not going to win this fight. And he'll sit there and he'll go back, back. He wants it to be back and together. And tears are streaming down his face. And it's one, it's one of them. I don't think the other one's actually ever really done this. It's only one of my kids that does this. Tears are streaming down his face. He's beat red. He's slouched in his chair. Sometimes the head is just being thrown back in this very uh, theatrical. And he's back, back. And he's trying to get this thing to go back together. And I'm like, I have no idea what to do with this. Dude, I, I have no together. idea. Other than being like, it doesn't go back. Do you give him a full one? Like, oh, is that caving? Sometimes, sometimes we'll give him a full one after that to kind of be like, here you go. But you know, it's like the situation is so irrational that he'll be like, no, and he'll kind of hit that aside. We, here's what we've tried to do. Here's a tactic that we've tried to take. It hasn't worked so far. But what we do is we say, you have to eat it, eat both pieces, chew them up real good, and they'll go back together in your tummy. That is <laughs> a lie. <laughs> In some ways, <laughs> it's definitely a lie, um, but kind of not too, but it's like, it's not, but I guess the thing is, is like, it's not a rational thought. That whole idea of like, put them in your mouth, chew them up, swallow them. They'll go back together in your tummy, but it seems to make sense in the moment. And there is sometimes when you start to say something like that, you kind of get this look on your face, like, like I'm going to impart some wisdom <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to do it in a fun looking way. I'm going to move my hands and I'm going to. Act and point to parts of your, I'm going to look at your belly. We're all pointing at your belly now. And it's sometimes it's enough, at least of a distraction. Yes. You're talking about a technique that I use frequently called distraction. This distraction. It's I think it's all is, about, it's just about shaking things up to the point where he's forgotten that he was all worked up. About yeah. It. I think that's really it. I think that's, I think that's really just boils down to let me theatrically say something and, and, and get a little over the top with a, an explanation that makes absolutely no sense to at the very least distract them out of that thing. And like, what are you talking about? What are you getting at? What are you pointing at my belly for? That's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. That's, that's the thing, thing in my house too. Back, my- back, that like very irrational 
you know, I want this, these, I want this banana to go back together. You've torn it into two. It needs to go back together and I yeah. won't eat it until it's back whole. And you want to say, dude, it, it doesn't matter. Dads and moms, you can find us at moderndadhood.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We would totally appreciate if you could give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen. That goes a long way for us. And if you don't want to do that, that's all right, too. But we would so appreciate it if you would just help us spread the word to your friends. If you are liking Modern Dadhood, any parent friends who you think might also enjoy it. You can reach out and drop us a line anytime at hey, H-E-Y, at moderndadhood.com. I want to thank Casper Baby Pants, Spencer Alby, and Bubby Lewis for the music for our podcast. And I want to send a big thank you to Pete Morse at Red Vault Audio for making us sound awesome. Lastly, I want to thank our intern, Nick Rose, for all the awesome work that he's done helping us promote Modern Dadhood on social media. Actually, I lied. There is one more. It's you. Thank you for listening. We really do appreciate it and stay safe.